the week with Ben Ellis. This is Switch. It's the week with me, Ben Ellis, here on Switch Radio on this Sunday afternoon. And it is the only story in town. It has been for many, many months now. Coronavirus uh, cases are continuing to rise up and down the country. And uh, in the next 24 hours or so, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson will announce new measures. A uh, proposed uh, tiered system will go into that and uh, other things relating to coronavirus with our guest right now, an independent virologist at, uh, let's get this right, at uh, virologyconsult.com, Dr. Robert Lampkin-Williams. Uh, hello, Dr. Robert. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. And yeah, there's, there's no sign of this, this thing either um, going away or, or coming under control. This is going very fast now. We're at a tipping point. There's no doubt about it. Professor John Van Tam, um, wrote about that overnight and we've now got twice as many cases as we did have in the first wave of the virus lots less people in hospital lots less people dying but those numbers are going up now as well so now we're also now going into the winter where we've got every all the other winter pressures going on to the nhs so it's going to be very very bumpy ride going through this winter is it a, a case of that there are more cases or there's just more testing now it, there, are, there are more cases. There is more testing. There's no doubt about that. There's not enough testing. We should have substantially improved testing. And there are serious problems in the testing um, regimes that are going on. But there are adjustments made in the statistics to allow for that. And overall, it's not just an increase in testing. We're seeing people going into hospitals. That's going up. We're seeing people, um, unfortunately, going on into intensive care. Those numbers are going up and we're seeing mortality and people dying, those numbers are going up. So it's not just cases. This is definitely a second wave of the disease. It is quite bad. In fact, it's very bad. And, and as you just mentioned, it, it's not just the second wave that we're, we're fearing here. It's the second wave crashing into what is usually around in the winter months uh, every single year. Absolutely. I mean, we, we're going into the winter months and we've got the common cold of which this is actually just a mutant variant of one of the common cold viruses, of one called rhinovirus. And then, of course, we've got flu, um, and that can hit the NHS on all on its own, and that can hit the NHS very badly. So anybody who's um, entitled to a free flu vaccine should be getting a free flu vaccine. That should be a real priority. But we've got what people are calling a twindemic heading towards us at the moment with COVID-19, the pandemic there and potentially a flu pandemic or epidemic rather attack, um, hitting us. So it's expected tomorrow that Boris Johnson is going to announce a uh, tiered system of restrictions up and down the country. It, it resembles traffic lights. So red, amber, green, red being the highest rates of infections, green the lowest. It's expected that Birmingham, where we are, will be in uh, tier two. But in the um, extreme cases, we're, we're talking about lockdown, as we saw before, aren't we? Very close to lockdown as it, it was before. Not absolute lockdown in the case as it was before, but you would have some pubs closing, you would have restaurants closing potentially. They are talking about trying to get restaurants open as much as possible. One of the important things to remember is that people will need to socialise. And then they, they've put up with a lot over the last six months. People want to see each other. So uh, pubs, although people instantly think, shut the pubs, that will solve the problem. It doesn't. It drives it underground and into house parties. And there we can't do track and trace. We can't keep you know, people separate from each other. Whereas a controlled environment like a pub, it's much easier to keep people in a controlled socialised environment. So yes, it will happen in big cases, three cases, top of the category cases. Some pubs will have to close. There's no doubt about it. But I don't, I think they'll try to keep socialization as controlled as possible and avoid people having big house parties. Do you think the 10 o'clock curfews worked? No. I think that uh, was a serious mistake. Um, I've not seen any evidence that suggests that was a good idea. Um, I think this, the, the abruptness of it as well, of everybody having to leave pubs at dead on 10 o'clock and go into the streets. And the off licenses, I'm not 
I'm going to remain, I'm not going to say where I'm specifically from, so I don't want to give them away, but the off-license near my local pub actually extended its hours an extra half an hour after 10 o'clock. Mm. So that people so, could go straight. Yeah, off. into a smaller space, uh, effectively. Um, yeah, okay. Because uh, what you would normally have is if, if, if the pubs were open till midnight, one o'clock, uh, maybe even two o'clock uh, on on the weekends, you, you'd get people leaving at staggered times. You, the first people that would leave would leave at ten o'clock. Um, yeah. Whereas everybody, well, I can stay till ten, so I'm going to stay till ten. I'm not going to leave at eight. So it's yeah. it's catch twenty two, isn't it? You, it, it is. um, yeah, and I'm not saying there won't be cases where certain pubs where they're not following the rules and it's mandatory they do, and people are not track and tracing when they're going in. They're not, and it's not only, and they must only have table service. Those well controlled pubs, that's in some cases, even they may have to shut them up. It's very, very bad. But in badly controlled pubs in city centres, it might be they do put curfews in place because of large numbers of people spin out. But a blanket ban, 10 o'clock, then people, as that, I don't think that was a good idea. I don't think there's been any evidence presented to say that was a good idea either. Do you think as well there's been confusion in uh, a few months ago the government said well, we're going to hand over responsibility for um, implementing restrictions and lockdown to local authorities and then once they see uh, evidence of cases rising like in the northwest for example they just go over the heads of the local authority and say uh, we're, we're doing this without any consultation whatsoever we've seen um, the mayor of greater manchester andy burnham very angry for example you know you, you can't say one thing and then go straight over their head surely yeah, uh, I listened to the interviews for Andy Burnham and he was furious um, and quite justifiably so. I mean, and it is one of one of possibly one of the mistakes in the past. And I hope you don't repeat here. It's a very centralised way of try, kind, trying to control this. We do need it to be much more local. We need track and trace to be much more local. And we need the areas that are restricted where, you know, if we go into this simplified traffic light system, it can be done in a more rational and localised way and I, I hear from the report today and the briefings overnight that the intention is that central government will work much more closely with the local authorities and that's important because they're the people who know, know what's happening in their area. Hindsight's 2020 of course and uh, we, we all know what's, exactly what's happening with the benefit of hindsight but uh, do you think it would have been uh, better if the government would have stayed sort of in-house with the track and trace system rather than subletting it out to um, various people like the Conservatives would um, they're not keeping it in-house? I, I think the government needed to get a track and trace system or a form of track and trace up very, very quickly. And one way of doing that is the way they did it, but what they should have very rapidly done, and you're right, hindsight is a wonderful thing, but what they are doing now is getting local authorities much more involved in the track and trace. Local authorities already have their own track and trace departments, for example, food poisoning outbreaks and that sort of thing. Now, they could not have coped on their own, but they could have been the epicenters of the track and trace supported by central government not central government going in there at the beginning and saying, right, we'll just break, break it all over. And then the NAP, of course, that arrived two weeks ago. when It should have arrived back in May time, I think. Yeah. So, you know, it, it would have been, I, it, as you say, hindsight, wonderful thing. But local authorities already had an established track and trace. So allow them to work on it, but give them the support they need. And just finally, um, the a lot of talk about uh, allowing crowds into um, sporting venues and we've had a couple of pilot schemes that have been sort of abandoned at the last minute and uh, we're getting into a situation where it almost seemed farcical where uh, England played Wales at Wembley the other night in an 80,000 seat completely empty stadium when the talk was surely you could do controlled social distancing to allow people into um, an event like this and, and if they're saying that um, the virus has been spread in the home, then isn't it a good idea in a controlled way to actually get out there and uh, and uh, enjoy things like sporting and cultural events? I think it's important we do have sporting and cultural events going on, but it has to be done in a safe and controlled manner. But it's not just that 80,000 seated stadium. That would have been several thousand people getting to that stadium. 
And that's the question is how do they get there? How do they get there on public transport? You know, how much social distancing is going on then? You know, and all of those things there. So it's not that just that one event, it's everything that leads to that event. So I think it can be done and it should be looked at in certainly in the lower risk areas. You know, it's a very important thing that we should continue as much as we can where the risk is low. But you've got to remember, it's not just that 80,000 seat of stadium. It's the public transport, every, everything that goes and supports around that building. And finally, finally, just projecting three, six months uh, down the line, uh, where will we be? Will we be in a situation where, um, obviously, we don't know where we are in terms of a vaccine, but are we, are we likely to um, still be where we are come March when it will be a year since uh, the lockdown came around? Um, there's, there's talk about herd immunity and, and things, things like that. What, in six months' time, where do you think we'll be? Herd immunity is controversial because we don't understand whether you can be reinfected properly with this virus. We've got some evidence that there may be some protection. We've got some evidence that some people will produce antibodies and we may possibly have a vaccine, but it won't be suitable for everybody at that time. We particularly need to protect those who are most vulnerable. Um, so I think we will still be in a quite bad place. Um, hopefully with the Nightingale hospitals, the reconfiguring of the hospitals, existing hospitals and staffing practices and that, they will be able to cope much better. It's not coming out at them out the blue. They are prepared this time. So hopefully we will handle the decision a bit better. So I'm a bit more optimistic than a complete disaster. So I think we'll get through it. Then we'll get into the summer and hopefully this will be, as we expect, to be quite a seasonal virus and we'll see a decline then. And we've got more, even more time to develop vaccines. Dr. Robert, Lamp uh, sorry, I was just going to say it will be a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. Uh, Dr. Robert Lampkin Williams, independent virologist at virologyconsult.com. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on the show today. You're welcome. Bye bye. Bye bye. For more great videos from the week, make sure you subscribe to our channel. It's down here somewhere. And don't forget, you can catch us on the radio every Sunday between 12 and 2 on FM across Birmingham 107.5, on mobile, on DAB and online. We're made for Birmingham. This is Switch Radio.